Hi, I'm Francine Belli and welcome to this live stream. Uh, today is our sixth episode and final of the uh, series, The Science Behind Why People Buy, where I'm researching and sharing with you the latest knowledge to make your marketing and branding more effective consistently rather than guessing. So if you are a marketeer, a business owner, an executive, a consultant, or somebody who is just interested in shaping behavior, this live stream is what you need to really get some answers to some of the questions that you've been asking yourself. So I'm live with Patrick Renvoisier, who is the co-author of the book, The Persuasion Code, How Neuromarketing Can Help Persuade Anyone anywhere, anytime. And he's joining us from Silicon Valley, uh, where it was 8 o'clock when he started. Now it's 8.40. <laughs> and I'm live streaming in London and it's 4 p.m. here. So Patrick, thank you for joining me live today. And I know that you have also recorded a LinkedIn live uh, uh, learning last time and uh, on neuromarketing, this very topic. Would you like to share a very briefly what that recording was all about and when we can expect that? Sure. Uh, so good morning. But uh, the idea is, uh, you know, when people try to communicate an innovative idea, they have different mediums to do that. One of the most famous mediums that people have been using is TED. So, you know, people have a TED talk. I recorded mine about eight years ago. And in the TED format, they give you 15 minutes to explain whatever it is you want to share. It's quite difficult to do it in 15 minutes, right? And TED has a certain level of professionalism. But then more recently, LinkedIn started to have an education arm. And LinkedIn education creates one-hour videos of people's content. So I received a call by LinkedIn about a year and a half ago saying that they wanted to learn more about your marketing. And they asked me if I could do an hour. Video and I said yes, no problem, and I did not realize how hard it would be. In fact, it took us three days to record that one hour wow. video, and I was coached by the LinkedIn people on how to make my content more appealing to an audience. And it was a great learning experience. The video is going to be released in January 2020 for people that have access to LinkedIn education, and it was a great learning experience for me. And uh, I hope that people will enjoy, you know, learning everything I've learned about sales and marketing and more marketing uh, in, in one hour. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing this. And I also look forward to this learning uh, uh, video when it comes. So I know that you'll have to rush. So I'm going to ask you the question I was going to ask you before the video now. Um, so tell me, actually, beyond what we've covered, what I'm going to share later in, um, you know, the um, this live stream, what are the questions that people mostly ask you when it comes to neuromarketing? Well, the first question is they ask, does it really work, right? So in neuromarketing uh, started about 20 years ago, and today we are beyond the piloting phase. In other words, we know that neuromarketing works because it gives us new insights into what people really want, and then we also learn new insights about what we should tell people if we try to persuade them. In other words, as we're talking now, Persuasion is moving from being an art to becoming purely a science. And you know, a lot of companies are very interested in doing it. Start with Facebook, with anybody who wants to influence you. Right? So we are in that phase right now where we know it works. It's still a very young science. Again, it's a science that just started about 15 years ago. So the science is still in its infancy. But we're getting more and more information. And What's relatively unique about what we do in my company is, to date, we still have the only complete map of persuasion. In other words, we call that the persuasion code, but we have the only scientific model of persuasion. In other words, if you think about it, persuasion had started to be researched about 40 or 50 years ago. It really started with you know, the onsets of psychology. And there are a number of authors and a number of people that are talking about the science, but they did not provide a complete overview of what it takes to persuade people, starting from, you know, what kind of question you need to start to ask and how does the relationship with the person you already have uh, changes your potentiality for persuasion. So but there is 
that people have given little hints about what persuasion is all about. And our purpose in life, and we've done that now for about 20 years, was to create a complete overview or a map of the persuasion process. In fact, I don't know if people can see our video, but, but this is our map. So our map was pub first published about 15 years ago. We've refined the map. We've uh, even given more scientific proof of the map. So, you know, one of the new things that we're starting to see now is that people see the benefit now of having a map, as opposed to just having a number of guidelines of what it takes to be a better persuader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I lo love that, um, you know, having a map. And uh, as I shared in the previous episode, how you actually... Um, break that down actually what is inside this map and how people can use that so tell me 2020 is around the corner here now what would you say that people should focus on in 2020 when it comes to sales and marketing is there something that in particular we should pay attention to yes uh, absolutely i mean i think people at whichever position on the continuum of prospecting all the way to closing you know you know, in a typical organization, you have a lot of people that are involved in the selling process. You know, the people that develop the website, the marketing communication people, the people that create all the posts on social media, the, the CEO, the CMO, the CSO. So there are a lot of people that play a role in creating an impression in the mind of the prospect or the customer. And up until now, a lot of people thought that the the key person, the key responsibility for being more persuasive, that responsibility was resting on the shoulders of the CMO, the chief marketing officer, or the VP of marketing. But as social media is, is exploding now, the customer is not getting his information from one single source. He's creating his impression about a company on the website of the company, of course, on all what he, what he or she hears in social media, in meeting with the salespeople, in receiving a proposal, in hearing system. And if they are not using the same persuasion model, if you want, it creates a dissonance in the brain of the prospect and it dissuades as opposed to persuades the prospects from buying. So I think that as the science, as the proof of how it works, become more prevalent, a lot more people in the organizations now need to learn about the science of persuasion. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Know, there is no more excuses now. In other words, you don't need a PhD in psychology or you don't need a PhD in normal marketing to learn that. You have to find where the information is available. You have to learn how your customers use their brain to make buying decisions. And then you need to create a consistency of messaging so that all the messages that your customers hear about you are consistent, that they continue to build a strong brand, and that at the end of the day, they trigger a desire from the customer to want to buy your product and services. So yeah. what I'm saying is that, that all this information is available today. All this, science, this information is made understandable from everybody, and there is no longer, you know, people should no longer use excuses of, oh, I'm too busy, I cannot do that. You know, to the degree that your job is important to convince more customers, everybody should learn about the science of persuasion. Yeah. So what you're saying is that regardless um, if it's next year, if it's this year, regardless, today we have all these resources and all this knowledge available and we should really make sure that we... We, we have the same message so that we don't create that dissonance in the head of our consumer. So everything is aligned. Um, and I'm going to share later also, you know, some of the key points that you shared in our previous um, episodes. So for actually Nozami Francophone, I know that uh, we have Francophone uh, people also on this, um, um, you know, uh, live stream uh, who like us to talk to them a little bit, perhaps in French. Est-ce que tu peux nous expliquer pourquoi est-ce que tu as écrit un livre sur euh, la persuasion et avoir euh, justement ce modèle de persuasion? Bah, la raison pour laquelle j'ai écrit ce livre sur la persuasion, c'est parce que d'abord, euh, bah, personne ne l'avait fait auparavant. Il n'y a qu'un certain nombre relativement restreint 
de chercheurs qui ont regardé vraiment le problème de la persuasion. Un des plus importants, il s'appelle euh, Robert Cialdini, il était directeur du, euh, du département de psychologie à l'université de Arizona, mm -hmm. Scottsdale, Arizona. Et depuis à peu près 30 ans maintenant, Cialdini avait publié le premier livre qui s'appelait The Psychology of Persuasion. Mais en fait, Cialdini, lui, ne, ne donne pas un modèle de persuasion. Il donne des, ce qu'il appelle des lois de persuasion. Mm -hmm. Et en fait, bon, je suis un, un, un fan de Cialdini depuis des années et des années. Donc, euh, ces règles de persuasion sont incluses dans notre modèle. Mais ça représente en fait qu'une petite partie du modèle. Mm -hmm. Donc, en fait, la, la raison pour laquelle je voulais faire un, un, un bouquin là-dessus, c'est parce que, en fait, il y avait vraiment personne qui avait relié tout, tous les concepts de la persuasion à un concept bien particulier dans le cerveau qui est le, le cerveau primaire. Yeah. Et euh, en 2002, il y a un chercheur qui s'appelle euh, Daniel Kahneman qui a écrit un livre qui s'appelle Think Fast and Slow. Il a d'ailleurs reçu le prix Nobel d'économie en 2002 pour son livre, dans lequel Kahneman dit que le, le secret de la persuasion, en fait, le secret de la manière dont les gens utilisent leur cerveau pour euh, prendre des décisions, tout est rattaché au cerveau primaire. Donc, avec ça, j'ai eu envie d'écrire un bouquin qui explique comment le cerveau primaire fonctionne et l'expliquer de telle manière que tout le monde le comprenne, parce que c'est quand même les, les sciences cognitives sont quand même très, très compliquées. Donc, j'ai voulu simplifier tout ce qui provient de la science du cerveau et de la psychologie, tout ramener à un seul contexte, concept qui est le cerveau primaire, et ensuite traduire ça en, un, en une série d'étapes dans notre modèle, il y a que quatre étapes. Mm -hmm. Donc, une série d'étapes simples pour que tous les gens qui touchent à la vente et au marketing, tous les gens qui ont besoin d'être plus influents, puissent euh, appliquer ça à leur business sans, encore une fois, investir 20 ans de leur temps pour avoir un PhD sur ce sujet. <rire> ok, ben bah, écoute, c'est super. J'espère que nos amis francophones vont faire justement l'effort de... Donc, euh, euh, je ne sais pas si votre livre a été traduit en français euh, Persuasion oui, Coach, il est, il, il est en, en traduit en français. Donc, ceux qui euh, ne sont pas tout à fait à l'aise en anglais peuvent donc accéder à votre livre euh, qui est euh, donc disponible en français. Sinon, euh, je vous remercie énormément, Patrick, euh, d'être euh, venu euh, en direct de San Francisco à cette heure euh, euh, matinale euh, chez toi. Et euh, ici, euh, il est 4 heures, presque 5 heures. Et je sais que chez toi, euh, il est bientôt 9 heures. Et euh, vraiment, merci beaucoup pour ta patience également, pour tous les pro nos problèmes techniques qu'on a eu euh, tout à l'heure. Et uh, and for all our English-speaking people, I would just like to thank Patrick for being here from Silicon Valley this morning and for his patience because we had some early tech problem, but he was so patient and he stayed along. And then I'm going to share with you some of our discussion, the part two of our discussion on a video whilst Patrick is going to go. And uh, Patrick, uh, it's a really a pleasure. So before you go, how people can get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you? Uh, no, our website is salesbrain.com, S-A-L-E-S-B-R-A-I-N.com. Uh, our book is on, on Amazon, so you know people can Google it. The book is titled The Persuasion Code. And at this point, uh, you know, our focus in 2020 is we're starting to create franchises or certified partners. So we just launched a program in the U.S. to train other people to deliver our content so that people will become master persuaders and they will go to uh, help other people be better persuaders. Cool. So thank you very much, Patrick. It was a real pleasure to have you today. And, uh, I'm, you and I'm just going to continue with my live streams. How can we actually uh, predict how people will react before we launch a campaign? Again, I, I, you know, you just uh, say that earlier. Um, is about understanding, not because at the moment, if you, you know, everybody asks what actually the customer wants, but obviously, as you know, you just say, sometimes they don't know. And I've seen that happening for myself many times. When you ask people what they want, they tell you something and then you deliver that to them and then there are no responses. Um, so how can we be better at, you know, formulating the best service or product that our customer perhaps will want, <laughs> if, if, well. even if they don't know that they want that now? Yeah, well, well, that's the job of a smart marketeer. In other words, 
if you hire a VP of marketing who has a lot of experience, first of all, he knows or she knows that it's in the quality of the question that you ask your customers that hopefully you will be able to extract the truth. In other words, if you ask your customers the wrong question, you will get the wrong answer. So you have to th when you do marketing, you have to think of yourself more of a psychologist as opposed to just a sales and marketing person. So that's why we make a difference between what people call the wants and what we, people call the pain. When you ask people, what do you want? They will formulate a certain answer. If you ask the question in a smart way enough, and if you put them in, them in a relaxed state, chances are you will get closer to the truth, right? But the whole idea is how can you access all these emotional movements that's going on inside the brain of your customers? Mm. So again, even, uh, I'll give you an example. 35 years ago, that was a small company in the United States and they made a research on home delivered pizzas. Now, if you ask me people, what do you want in terms of pizza? They will tell you, oh, I want extra pepperoni, I want the pizza to be delivered you know, really quickly, and I want uh, a really good cheese, and I want to make sure the cheese doesn't stick to the lid, and blah, blah, blah. That's if you ask them what they want. But do you know what is the number one pain of the average consumer of pizza in the US? In other words, what is that negative emotion that drives the behavior of an average consumer of pizza in the US? Let me tell you what it is. It's the anxiety of not knowing when the pizza will arrive. Mm -hmm. And 35 years ago, there was a small pizza shop in the area of Detroit who discovered that, and they came up with a slogan. And their slogan was, 30 minutes or less, or it's free. And guess what? That little pizza shop became Domino's as we know it. Yeah. So very early on, Domino's realized they are not in the pizza business. They are not in the tomato sauce, crust, and pepperoni business. They are a FedEx organization which happened to sell pizza. And the pizza is just an accessory to the business. So again, even with only traditional, but good traditional marketing, you can achieve incredible results. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between what people want. They want a pizza, but what's their pain? It's not knowing when the pizza will arrive. Mm. Yeah, no. Uh, yes, that's definitely a great, actually, distinction, actually, to make. And actually, um, you know, just um, to follow up on that one, uh, in one of your interviews, actually, you say that, you know, company, including Domino Pizza, Apple, Starbucks, actually, it's not that they have, like, a superior product, or they might have it, but actually, what actually makes their success is, is really their brand promise. Can you actually help us to understand what makes a great brand promise actually like them. So first of all, I think we have to define what a brand is. Now, I, you know, my background is engineering, right? I'm an engineer by background. And I like very precise definition. And I was roaming the world for 30 years without a good definition of what is a brand. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to make sure we define a brand with something very, very precise. Okay. So here is the best definition that I fell onto one day. Mm -hmm. And that's the one I've been using ever since. Okay. So a brand is an associative memory inside the brain of the consumer, which connects the name of the brand with a positive brand attribute or a quality of the product or the service. So let me explain. Again, it's an associative memory in the brain of the consumer that connects the name of the brand with a positive brand attribute or brand quality. So I'm going to throw a brand that most people in the world recognize. So it's a very simple exercise. So I'm going to, I'm going to do the test with you, okay? okay so I'm going to put the name of a car at you, and I'm going to ask you, why do people buy that brand of car? Okay. Right? So are you ready? Yep. So if I say Volvo, yeah. what's the claim? Why do you think do people buy Volvo? Mm, it's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Volvo's are not really cheap. Now, again, you have to be a little careful because what, I do this test in the U.S. Yeah. And Volvo in the U.S. have had a very strong communication campaign for the last 50 years. Okay. So when you ask, when you tell people in the U.S., and you know, I, I do that test every day. So when you tell people in the U.S. Volvo, they instantly associate the brand Volvo with safety. Okay. Because for the longest period of time, Volvo was designing tank-like cars, right? 
So at least in the US, right, Volvo mm -hmm. has been able to associate in the brain of the consumer mm -hmm. the concept that if you buy a Volvo, you will get a safe car. And mm -hmm. if you want to buy a safe car, you will get a Volvo. So those two concepts of Volvo and safety are anchored into the mind of the average American consumer. Mm -hmm. So it's right there. Right? So it's an associative memory. So the problem is, as you can imagine, for Volvo to achieve that association, it takes a lot of advertising. Yeah. And for the last 40 or 50 years, in the US, Volvo has always been advertising safety for their car. In fact, if you go on their website, even today, it says safety from every angle. Mm -hmm. So that's what this issue of the brand is. It's you have to define what you want your customer to remember you for, yeah. mm -hmm. why they should buy from you. Yeah. And in the case of Volvo, they made that decision strategically 60 years ago. There was a board meeting at Volvo headquartered and they said, well, let's look at the positioning of all our competitors and what can we make unique about our car? And they said, well, we can make our car unique by making it the safest car on the planet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So sadly, it didn't work that well for you, but I know you're in Europe. It's yeah, not exactly. Same. Because I don't think that anybody in Europe will, you know, associate to that. Right, right. In <laughs> but, so yeah. that's what a brand is. Okay. So what that means is if you're a smart marketeer, your job is to establish early on what's going to make you unique, why people are going to be buying from you. Mm -hmm. And then to create that associative memory inside the brain, you're going to need to stick with it for a long time and you're going to need to repeat it many, many times to create that very strong association. Right? Mm -hmm. That's why advertising doesn't work the first time, you know, advertising budgets, they only work in the long run. Yeah. 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 So uh, just to, to stay on branding aspects, actually, I do work also with personal branding. So, um, you know, how can we also use the neural map in personal branding, actually? Well, because personal branding is selling yourself. Mm -hmm. So anytime you're sending a resume or you're, uh, you're, you're meeting with people, you have to decide what's going to make me unique. How can I bring value to the people in front of me? So personal branding is, you know, the idea of constantly selling yourself. So all these principles of persuasion works in the case of a single individual. Yeah, that's great. So, um, so you also talked about four magical questions that you actually need to ask when you are looking for uh, inside the science of persuasion. Can you tell us briefly what those four magical questions are and, you know, to push that buy button? Or I don't sure. know if you are still, if you are still uh, framing that as buy button in the head of our customer. Sure. So those first questions are the one that I showed you on the map here. The first one is what are the pains in the brain of your customers? Mm -hmm. And what do you do to diagnose those pains? Remember again that if you're selling pizza, that pain has nothing to do with the pizza. It's the emotion of the anxiety of not knowing when the pizza will arrive. Yeah. The second question is, how do you differentiate your claims? In other words, most likely you have competitors and they offer something which looks very similar to yours to eliminate even the same pain. So what's gonna make you unique in the mind of your customer so that they see enough contrast between your solution and their solution, and we call that the claims. Mm -hmm. The third question is, how do you demonstrate the gain? And we define gain as the difference between value and cost. The question becomes, when your customers hear your value proposition, can they immediately see and understand it? How do you demonstrate it? Do you go by just saying, oh, if you buy from me, I will save you a million dollars next year? You don't prove it. Or do you quantify it and do you prove it with very tangible proof that a very skeptical brain like the primal brain will accept? So again, the first three steps are diagnose the pain, differentiate your claims, demonstrate the gain. And answering the three questions will formalize the content of your message. So it will help you solve the equation of what is it that you need to communicate to best persuade? Yeah. And then the fourth question is, how do you deliver that message to the primal brain? So the fourth question is, how do you communicate it so that a brain that's 500 million years old will understand it? 
So it's all the idea of how do you generate emotion when you communicate your message? How do you make your message more visual? So for example, a technique would be to, to use a prop. You know, just like this object that I have in front of me, mm -hmm. a prop, an object, in this case, a map. Yeah. In our case, we talk about a map. That makes it much more tangible and therefore the primal brain will understand it much better. Yeah. Also, it's also the art of how do you build a story? You know, because we know stories have a have the capacity to transport the listener into another world. And, and that works, if you make that world very believable, then the primal brain of your audience will understand it. So this is where our model gets a lot richer. Mm -hmm. And this is what we call the chemistry of persuasion. And that last step here is about using a very specific vocabulary, which we call persuasion elements. Okay. And a grammar to that vocabulary, which we call persuasion catalyst. Mm. And one of those persuasion calories, for example, is telling stories. Another one is wording in the language of you. Now, because the primal brain is very selfish, if I, if I keep saying me, my product, my services, your brain does not understand it. Instead, yeah. if I say you will oh, be able yeah, to... Yeah. I wake up, yes, definitely. Yeah, that's right, you wake up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah. that's the four questions. Yeah, no, that's brilliant, Patrick. Uh, final question is that uh, I like uh, you to explain this uh, loss aversion bias and its implication. I really love the way that you explain that. But you know, can you briefly touch about uh, you know this loss aversion bias as well? So the loss aversion bias again was discovered by Kahneman in about two thousand two, and here is what it says. Mm -hmm. Now imagine I am trying to sell you. I'm looking around my desk here. Okay. A pen, right? Yeah. So imagine I'm trying to sell you this pen, uh -huh. and imagine this pen is worth two point three dollars. If you didn't have the loss aversion bias, we could say that because you're receiving two point three dollars of value, you would be willing to pay two point three dollars in return because that's a fair trade. You get two point three, that creates a positive emotion, and you lose two point three, that creates a negative emotion, and it should be balanced. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because of the loss aversion bias, Kahneman demonstrated that for you to lose $1, the negative emotion of losing $1 makes it so that your psyche is expecting to receive in return not $1, but 2.3 times that amount of value. Mm -hmm. So what that means, again, is from a psychological perspective, from an emotional perspective, for people to receive $2.3 of value in that object, they're only willing to pay $1. And of course, that explains a lot, just in itself. First, that explains why it's really hard to sell. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny how we love to buy and we hate to sell. Why? Because we know it's hard to sell. And why is that? It's because of the loss aversion bias. Because every time you're selling something which is worth this much, your customer is expecting to receive this much. You know, in other words, everybody wants to drive a Porsche, but nobody wants to pay more than the price of a regular Honda or Toyota for it, right? Yeah. And oh, by the way, that also explains why the 50% discount is so effective. Why? Because when you give your customers 50% discount, you have said that 2.3 times loss aversion bias. Yeah, I think that is brilliant, actually. But what that, what that mean that each time when you are kind of presenting your product or service, you have to kind of double the value that you can have in your customer mind in order to sell that to the price that you want to? Correct. Yeah, yeah, so that's, uh, that's I think that was a very quite insightful actually uh, to, to, to understand this uh, loss of aversion, if, um, you know, bias. Uh, is there anything else that, you know, I didn't ask you and then you feel that it will be also quite important for people to know um, to be good at persuading uh, their customers to buy from, you know, them rather than their competitors? No, my, my advice to them is that do not trust your own instinct. In other words, most likely, if you've been trained in a formal way, you believe that persuasion is all about using logic. It does not work. So the more you understand how illogical homo sapiens is, uh, the better you will become. And there is uh, two benefits for you. One is you will become a better persuader. And two, you will be able to protect yourself better against your own impulses. Mm. You know, recently I had to buy, I, I had to buy a new car. Mm -hmm. And I was going to the Porsche dealership and I go, oh, yeah, one of 911. <laughs> you didn't go for a Volvo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I was thinking to myself, you know, well, you know, I'm at this point of my life where I could afford to buy a nice 
Porsche. Uh -huh. And I went, but you know, Patrick, you spend your life in an airplane. I log less than 3,000 miles per year in my car. I really don't need a Porsche, right? So I was able to control my own impulse by saying, you probably don't really need one of those cars. I'm already married, you know, so why need <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't buy that. So you reason yourself to not buy it. That's good. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patrick, uh, for your time. That was a pleasure to have you and, uh, you know, sharing uh, your knowledge uh, in neuromarketing and what you've been doing for two decades. Um, really, thank you for your generous, um, you know, insight in this. Thank uh, you, Francie. No problem. Bye-bye now. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Wow. So we are back. So now... Patrick and I would love to hear from you. What are your key takeaways that you are taking away from this episode of today and also the whole series, the whole six episodes uh, of uh, the series, the science behind why people buy? Leave me a comment in the section below and let me know what actually is your key takeaway. If you haven't watched the previous replays, you can watch all the six episodes and the six key takeaways, key set of key takeaways on my webpage, which is francinebelay.com slash neuromarketing. Again, that's francinebelay.com slash neuromarketing, where you're going to get all the replay and the key takeaway from each of the episodes. So thank you for really watching and I'm preparing an exciting program for 2020. Uh, let me know which kind of topic that you love to hear from or you like to learn a little bit more and then uh, I'll, I'll have a look and then we'll see which actually are the most popular topic and I'm going to include that in the program of 2020. So it was, you know, I, I, I wish you a very great festive season. It was great pleasure to have you and uh, until then, dream, act and make an impact. Lots of love.